Good morning. Good morning, we are getting ready to start. Okay, good morning, dear Commissioner, Honorable Member of the European Parliament, dear friends of sport. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to our traditional Sport Info Day, which aims at informing you about the opportunities given by the Erasmus Plus program. This event is organized by the Executive Agency for Education, Audiovisual and Culture, which is responsible for the management of this action in close cooperation with Director General for Education and Culture in the European Commission. In a few minutes, our Sport Info Day will be opened by Commissioner Gabriel, Commissioner responsible for sport, among many other things, and Mr. Tadeusz Frankowski, President of the Sport Group in the European Parliament. However, before we start, I would like to give you some practical information in order to allow you to make the best use of this event. First of all, interpretation is available in five languages, English, French, German, Spanish, and Italian. Sign language is also available, as you can see it. Again, this year, even in an online format, we are proposing you several tools to enhance the networking opportunities. The specific mobile app, tailor-made in the last year's info days, that some of you know already, is made available again this year. Its name is Connects Me. It will give you the opportunity to have in your hands, with your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone, all the information related to the event program, presentations, list of participants, areas of interest, etc. It will also give you the opportunity to network, to interact with other participants and to organize meetings, of course virtual, with potential partners. Last year, around 12,000 messages were exchanged among participants. This tool will also allow participants to raise questions to the speakers, and which can then be shown on the main screen. You have, I think, already been contacted in order to create your profile and to present to you how to make the best use of this tool. And I must underline as well that this possibility is not only open to the 1,450 participants who are officially registered, but also the non-registered participants can download the app and interact with the speakers and the other participants. The hashtag SportInfoDay is available on Twitter, and you can already post your comments and pictures, as well as inform your followers about this event. These are the practical information that I wanted to give you before we start. And now I will invite Commissioner Gabriel and the member of the European Parliament, Frankowski, to open formally the event. Commissioner Gabriel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Very pleased to be together with all of you, dear participants, dear Thomas, dear friends of sport. First of all, it is a true pleasure for me to launch this ninth edition of Sport Info Day. As you know, this year we have thousands of participants following the event online. But even behind the screen, one thing remains the same. Your commitment to sport and to its values. And I would like to thank you for that. Without the effort and passion of so many of you, our program could never hope to reach those who need our support the most. Ultimately, together we make the sports chapter of Erasmus Plus come true. And this Sport Info Day is about informing you of the opportunities of our ambitious Erasmus Plus program for the period 2021-2027. And after all, the sport chapter of the program is a bridge from grassroots to elite sport. Erasmus Plus is key in supporting sport today and in the future. And as we know, making it possible is important, but it is not the same as making it happen. Qualifying for a championship makes victory possible, 
but you still have to fight to make it happen. Ultimately, you make the sports chapter of Erasmus Plus come true. Our role at European level is to help you cross this bridge and bring sport to more people across Europe. From grassroots sport organizations to the large established institutions, Erasmus has been a driving force aimed at supporting sport in all its dimensions. And we want to build on this success. I'm proud to say that despite the difficult year we had, this community has given us an incredible response. In 2021, we received more applications than ever, more than 1,300. Soon, all our successful applicants will have the chance to put their projects to work and make their innovative ideas a reality. And this fills me with confidence for 2022, especially because this year is marked by two very exciting events, the 35th anniversary of Erasmus Plus and the European Year of Youth. And sport will play a key role in both. We have plenty to celebrate. First, we have a stronger Erasmus Plus sport budget. We are increasing the budget for the sport calls to over 70 million euros. In addition, the budget for cooperation partnerships is moving closer to the 40 million euros mark. And this will allow us to fund more projects, bring more opportunities and reach out to more organizations. Your dedication and commitment is having a real impact and this budget increase is a clear feedback, keep going. Second, we want to provide even more opportunities for participation and to make Erasmus Plus more open to international cooperation. This is why we are launching a new call to build capacity and broaden our support community to the Western Balkans. Our main goal is to forge links between Europe and the Western Balkans agenda for innovation, research, education, culture, youth and sport. And third, of course, something very close to my heart, we are advancing with our new initiative, Healthy Lifestyle for All. It opens a new era in promoting a healthy lifestyle as it seeks cross-sectoral approach to address health and physical activity with the aim of establishing community of practice across generations and social groups. It is shaped, as you know, around three main pillars. First, improving awareness of healthy lifestyles across generations. Second, easier access to sport and physical activity with special focus on inclusion and non-discrimination to reach disadvantaged groups. And third, teaming up with experts across fields towards a holistic approach to food, health, well-being and sport. And the success of this initiative will only be possible with your active involvement. These three pillars of our effort to improve the lifestyle of people in Europe will also be able to rely on Erasmus Plus funding now that we have added the promotion of a healthy lifestyle as a new priority in the program. We have invited everyone from the largest sport organizations to the smaller sport clubs to join in, make their pledge for healthy lifestyle for all and share it with the rest of Europe. Since the launch in September, we have received 45 pledges coming from all corners of Europe. We have seen the World Health Organization, the International Olympic Committee and the European Olympic Committees, WADA, FIFA, UEFA, along with many European umbrella sport organizations and our member states following our call and signing pledges at the opening of the European Week of Sport. And for this, I thank each of them. Last but not least, we are bringing the Healthy Lifestyle for All initiative a step further, with 2022 being the year of youth. It is a good occasion to ask young people to help us promote sport and healthy lifestyles. This is why at this year's European Sport Forum, I will invite a group of young people across Europe to meet and brainstorm on how to boost physical and mental health through the healthy lifestyle for all youth ideas labs. I look forward to listening to the ideas. So dear friends, to conclude, let me thank you once again for your presence with us today 
and for your work over the years to make the sport Strand of Erasmus Plus a real success. These two days will be very intensive and with a lot of information to digest. My team is here to answer all your questions. I look forward to your ideas and to transform them into real projects. And I hope to see you very soon in our major annual events, starting with the European Sport Forum and our European Week of Sport in September. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much, you very Commissioner much. Gabriel. And now I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Frankowski, President of the Sports Group in the European Parliament. Gentlemen, dear friends of sport. First, I would like to congratulate Commissioner Maria Gabriel for this initiative of organizing the Erasmus Plus Sport Info Day. I would also like to thank Yves Lelostek from the Education, Audiovisual and Culture Executive Agency and Flor Van Hout from the Sport Unit for inv invitation for to this, to today's event. Given the pandemic context, this year's in Sport Info Day is very relevant and important for the whole sports sector and its recovery. After a difficult year, for all of us, we need sport even more. That is precisely where the new Erasmus Plus program steps in. It acts as a bridge between the need for more sport and the will of individuals and organizations to make it happen. The Sport Info Day is about informing you of these opportunities as there is a new amb and ambitious Erasmus Plus program. From grassroots to elite sports, Erasmus Plus is key to supporting sport today and in the future. For all these reasons, I'm very proud that, that we, European Parliament, Commission and the Member States gathered in the Council have managed to considerably increase the budget of the new Erasmus Plus program and its share for sport to almost 500, 500 million euros. This is about 200 million euros more than in the previous program, which is a great news. In the European Parliament, we fought for the inc this increase to fund even more projects, bring more opportunities and reach out to more organizations. While this is a step forward, I think that given the social and economic importance of sport and in any future review of the program should treat sport on an equal budgetary footing with other priorities such as health and culture. There is also a need to increase the number of preparatory actions and pilot projects in the field of sport and as they can lead to successful results like the exchange of and mobility of coaches and sports staff, which is now part of the new edition uh, of the Erasmus Plus program. This great outcome of the Erasmus Plus program and some successful examples of the pilot projects have shown that good collaboration between the European institutions, member states and sports sector is crucial. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may know, I was a reporter of the report of the EU sport policy, which was adopted by a large majority in the European Parliament last year. This report aims to show the way, way forward for the future of European sport policy and calls for this increased cooperation between institutions and sports stakeholders. Of course, my work on this report is not finished yet, but uh, I would even say that the most important part is coming now in terms of implementation. As the reporter, together with my colleagues from the CALT committee uh, and sports uh, group, we need to put pressure of the European Commission and member states in order to see these recommendations put into force. Dear friends of sport, at the end, I need to say that sport not only changed the world, but allows many people to change their lives. As a former football player, and now an MEP, I am certainly an example of this. Sport help us stay healthy, happy, teach us valuable skills at any age and opens many new opportunities. That is why it's important to stay active, not only by practicing sport, but also by learning about the possibilities that the new Erasmus Plus program brings 
and by applying for the sport projects. Thank you very much and I wish you an interesting discussion. Thank you so much, Member of the European Parliament, Frankowski, and thank you, Commissioner Gabriel, for both having stressed the importance of our Sport Info Day. This is now a major rendezvous of the sports agenda, and I, our, today our event will, uh, has already generated an intensive social media activity via Twitter with the hashtag Sport Info Day. In the past, we had a, a big audience of two million people, and I hope that this year it will be the same, that you will confirm this trend. There is also an important live stream on Facebook that reached last year 35,000 people, so please continue doing so. And let's underline our main purpose today. We are here to provide you with clear and precise information about Erasmus Plus and its possibilities, about the calls and the novelties of this year in the field of sport. We want to help you to find all the relevant information that you need in order to prepare and submit an application. Please do take advantage of the information that you will receive today. Use the opportunity to meet online via the Connects Me app and really interact with other participants who are also interested in submitting an application. My last words will be about the program, the agenda. Our Sport Info Day will last two days. Today, just after this opening session, we'll have a session of presentation of the Erasmus Plus program, starting at 10. It will be followed by a session on the program priorities of the Erasmus Plus program, starting at 11.30. We will finish our work at 12.30, and tomorrow we will start at 9.30. Then three technical sessions will follow, one on the Erasmus Plus submission procedure, one on the evaluation process, and one on the new funding mechanism. We should also finish tomorrow at 12.30. This is the program in summary. We are now coming to the end of our opening session. Thank you again, Commissioner Gabriel and Member of the European Parliament, Frankowski, for having been with us today and for having really stressed the importance of our, of our work. Thank you. And now we will move to the second session I will give the floor to my colleague Yves Lelostek, head of the Erasmus Mundus and Sport Unit in the Executive Agency. Thank you for your attention and thank you for being with us today. Enjoy the day and tomorrow. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. And, uh, and first of all, I would like to, to welcome you to this first session of our Sport Info Day, which will be about the objectives and structure of the Erasmus Plus Sport. Uh, as mentioned by Sophie, I am the head of the Erasmus and Sport uh, Unit in the agency, so dealing with the sport part uh, of the of the program in, in particular and as uh, some of you uh, may know i have been uh, during a couple of years the uh, head of the sport unit in the european commission um, i am together in this session with the head of the sports sector gail bros who will in a couple of uh, minutes make a presentation an in-depth presentation about the erasmus plus program and uh, i am uh, also here together with our uh, well-known uh, colleague uh, Luciano Di Fonso, who will also be with us in order to, to answer questions uh, after the presentations. So as, uh, as it was underlined by the commissioner and by our, our friend uh, Thomas Frankowski, uh, we are very happy here to notice the presence of so many people and so many sport organizations in uh, what is a, a virtual rule. Uh, because Erasmus Plus, with Erasmus Plus, we have a great tool uh, a tool which is here, which is there to help sport organizations and sport stakeholders to develop their projects. So it's very important for us and for you uh, that you make good use of it and that you know all the possibilities given by this program. And today, and, uh, and Sophie uh, underlined this, uh, what, what we want to do today is a good moment to listen, but also to ask questions and to interact. Uh, you know that this program, this uh, Erasmus Plus program we are discussing today, is 
the second one. It's part of the second generation of program. Uh, the first one uh, was uh, the Erasmus 2014-2020, and last year we started with the new generation 2021-2027. Last year, uh, in this same spot info day, uh, we had the opportunity to present you this new Erasmus, this new generation. So for some of you, uh, some things are already been known. Uh, there were, compared to the past, some important evolutions, which were new last year, which are not new anymore, but which were new last year. I just remind you in, uh, in general terms of this uh, evolution. So you heard that now, you know that now we have horizontal priorities. It was not the case in the past. Now, there are horizontal priorities which are common to all Erasmus Plus parts, education, youth, training, and which are also, I would say, horizontal priorities of the Commission, and which now apply to sport. Huh? And um, Gael will mention them uh, again later, but they are about inclusion, they are environment and climate change, they are about innovation, they are about common values. And now our program, our sport part of the program, allows us to valorize the contribution of sport to these priorities. So this is a very important evolution which was presented last year. The second one is more about continuity, but I mentioned it. Uh, we have also specific sport priority integrity, education in and through sport, fight against discrimination, violence in sport, also the pro participation in sport and physical activity. And uh, what, uh, what was mentioned by the commissioner, our policy on healthy lifestyle is part of this. These spe specific priorities were, in a way, there in the past generation of program, but uh, an important evolution is now that there is not specific share between priorities. You remember that in the past we had, uh, for instance, 20% on integrity, 30% on, uh, uh, on health-enhancing physical activity. This is no longer the past. Now, um, let's say, uh, things are completely uh, open and, uh, and there is no quota anymore per priority. A very important evolution, of course, is the one on lump sums. We now have lump sums, and this is a major evolution this is because this represents a big simplification, a major simplification for further uh, for sport organizations and stakeholders. We have spoken a lot in the past about simplification. Simplification of our program was a permanent, a constant request of you, of our stakeholders and our, our partners in projects, and I think we have made a very important step forward in the, in, um, with the new generation of program. And the last one I will mention, of course, is about budget. We will, with this new generation of program, almost double the budget of sport Erasmus Plus as a whole, but on, uh, on the sport part in particular. So this was the main evolution last year. This year, it will be more about continuity uh, with some, uh, small, with some uh, changes that we will underline, and one of them is uh, in the introduction of a new action, which is about capacity building. We will come to this later. Now, to conclude my uh, initial presentation before I give the floor to, 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 to Gael, I will just like to pass three uh, messages. So, th the first one is about the budget. This year, there will be more, more budget than last year, and so there will be more projects financed. Just uh, two figures. In 2021, in the general call, uh, 41 million were at stake. In 2022, 51 million will be at stake. Uh, so more or less 10 million more, allowing us to finance much more projects. This year, uh, we will finance more or less between uh, uh, 207 and 208 projects. Next year, we will finance between uh, 340 and 350. These are approximations, of course. Huh? So first message, 
more money, more financial possibilities, more budget. The second message is uh, about uh, the, the results, uh, the, the calendar, sorry, the calendar. Uh, last year, you know, uh, we had a, 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 a calendar which was uh, um, very different from the past. Uh, it was, uh, I, I, w I was about to say, chaotic, it's not the right words, but everything was postponed because it was, there was a late adoption of the program. And of course, this had consequences with everything, with the deadlines, with the, with the selection of projects, uh, with everything. And of course, sport organizations and stakeholders had less time to, to submit projects. This year, we will come back more or less to a normal calendar, to a normal roadmap. And I think this is good news because this is this allows more time to prepare. Our call has been published in uh, la last November, so there, there is this for, uh, spot in for day to day, so there is more time to prepare. There will be normal time to organize a selection, and, and the results should be published before the end of the year. So this is, so we come back to normality. And the third and last message, and I know that some of you are waiting for, for this, it's about the results of 2021. Before the question is asked, I anticipate the answer. Um, the result should be published in the coming two, three weeks, let's say. Uh, mid, in principle, mid-January, uh, mid we will have results. Why uh, fe uh, February, sorry. Uh, why, why so late? Just because uh, for the reasons I explained before. Uh, late adoption of the legal base, calls which were launched launch later, uh, everything was delayed. So this is why, uh, exceptionally, uh, this year pub results will be published uh, two months later than uh, in the past, more or less, but results should now come soon. We are really in the last, last procedural phase before uh, the communication of the results. This is what I wanted to, to say as an introduction. And now I will give the floor to, to Gahel, the head of the sports sector, who will make a presentation, a more detailed presentation about Erasmus Plus Sport. Gahel, please. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. So in this session, I will, I will wait, wait for the, the, for the, the presentation, presentation to start. start. Okay, we're just fixing a technical issue and it should be solved in the coming uh, seconds, I imagine. Yeah. Yes, so the answer is yes, so we should soon have the presentation. I think it's coming, yes, so Gael, please. Thank you. Here is the presentation. Um, so today I will present you the, the sport action covered by the Erasmus Plus program guide. I will mainly focus on the structure of the program and the objectives of the, of the sports actions. In-depth presentation on how to apply funding mechanisms, uh, applicable criteria will be made tomorrow morning by the by the sector team. So I hope you will be able to to attend because this is where key informations will um, uh, will be provided to help you apply. So as explained by Eve, the Erasmus Plus program has key horizontal priorities applicable across the board. So. It seeks to promote um, access across all its actions and foster participation of people with fewer opportunities. Uh, 
So when designing the projects, organizations should have an inclusive approach, making them accessible to a diverse range of participants. Other key priorities are to promote the use of digital tools and the development of digital skills. Also to contribute to the fight against climate change and uh, by fostering sustainable behaviors, so including in uh, sport projects. And at last, um, the program aids at tackling, um, at raising awareness and understanding of the European Union context, notably as regards um, to um, European values. So here is how the Erasmus Plus program is structured. So um, next to the Jean Monnet actions, we have three key actions dedicated to mobility of individuals for action one, cooperation among organizations and institutions under uh, key action two, and policy development under action three. The, the, all the sports action that we're going to discuss today and tomorrow are covered and, uh, by the key action two. So here they are, in um, the key, key action, the actions in the field of sports. We have four actions. Two of them are under the chapter Partnership for Cooperation. We have the flagship action, collaborative partnerships in the field of sport, the small scale partnerships, our new action uh, capacity building projects in the field of sport, and the, an action that you already know, the not-for-profit European um, sport event. In line with the specific sport policy and the Healthy Lifestyle for All initiative, the priorities of the action under the cooperation partnerships uh, are, here, uh, are here described. So first of all, encouraging healthy lifestyle for all. It's to increase the level of participation in sport and physical activity as a tool for health and well-being. Well -being. To promote the integrity of and value of in sport, so projects under this activity would focus on tackling threats to the integrity of sport, such as doping, match fixing, and corruption. Also under this uh, priority is the promotion of positive value and good governance in sport. A third priority is to promote education through sport. So project under this, um, this priority would be supporting skills development in sport, encouraging dual careers uh, of athletes, promoting the quality of coaching and uh, staff, using mobility as a tool for improving qualifications, or promoting employability through sport. And then we have also four specific action, which is the fight uh, to fight behaviors that have an impact, uh, a negative impact um, over the practice of sport. So project under this, um, this priority would focus on fighting violence, but also all kinds of intolerance and discrimination, and promote equality in sport, including gender equality. To do all that, we have a budget, we have a total envelope of almost 52 million euros. As, uh, as explained by the Commissioner and by Eve, it's a substantial increase compared to last year. And each action is allocated uh, a specific budget. So under the cooperation partnership uh, action, we have a budget of 35.6 million, and we expect to support around 125 projects. For small scale cooperation uh, action, we have a budget of 9.5 uh, uh, million, and we expect to support 200 projects. For the not-for-profit fit European sport events, we have a 6 million budget and expect to support around 18 projects. 
And for the new uh, capacity building action, um, we have a budget of um, 755,000 euros and, and we expect to support five projects. So I'll start with the cooperation partnerships. With 70% of the budget, this, uh, the cooperation partnerships aims to help organizations raise the quality and relevance of the activities, to re reinforce the network of partners, and also to reinforce the capacity to operate at transnational level. The action is open to organizations based in uh, European member states or third country associated to the program. They can all participate either as coordinator or as partner. If they bring added value to the project, organizations established in countries not associated to the program can participate, to the exception of Belarus. To be eligible, projects must involve a minimum of three organizations from three different EU member states or third country associated to the program. That means that if you have um, particip participants from a country not um, associated to the program, that will have to come on top of this minimum criteria. The project duration is between 12 and 30, uh, 36 months to be established in the application and in the grant agreement. And uh, all activities must take place in the countries of the organizations involved. Um, the, there are two exceptions. Activities can also take place, place at the seat of a European institution. And also, if the activity is uh, the promotion of results, it can take place at a relevant thematic um, conference or transnational events. Our second action is the small scale partnership. So the principle is that it's, it's an action aims at widening the access to the program to small scale actors. So it foresees smaller amounts it's a, a, uh, it will be, as we will see later, it's a lump sum of uh, between 30,000 30, or 60,000 euros. Shorter duration, so it can be shorter projects from uh, six month projects. Simpler administrative procedure, so one work package uh, is allowed or even recommended. And smaller consortium, the uh, project can be presented with just um, two, um, two participants involved. By reducing entry barriers to the program and proposing small-scale support, the action is intended to reach out grassroots organizations and new pro, uh, newcomers to the program. It offers a first step into cooperation at EU level. It aims to support inclusion of uh, target groups with fewer opportunities and uh, bring EU dimension at local level. Also important, or important, it aims to build the capacity of organizations, even the smaller ones, to work transnationally. The, organ uh, the, um, the action is also open to uh, participants established in EU member states or third countries associated to the program. To the, uh, to the, um, contrary to the um, cooperation partnerships, uh, participation um, part, um, organization based in countries not associated to the program cannot take part. To be eligible, consortium must involve a minimum of two organizations from two different program countries. And the, uh, regarding the activities, they can take place in the country of the organizations involved. And there is one exception only. Uh, it can also take place in, at the seat of a European institution, if no partner, even if no partner is involved in the, uh, is based in the country in question. A third action is um, capacity building in the field of sport. 
So it's a new action under the program 2022. It aims to support multilateral, multilateral partnerships between organizations and uh, active in the field of sport in program countries and in third countries not associated to the program. So that sport activities and policies can act as a vehicle to promote values, as an education tool to promote personal and social development, but also as a way to foster, uh, to, to foster uh, cohesive communities. The objectives of the action are targeted at third countries not associated to the program. So with a view to raise the capacity of grassroots organization, um, to, to raise the capacity of grassroots sport organization, to encourage the practice of sport and physical activity in this country, but also to promote social inclusion and positive value to sport, and to foster international cooperation through joint initiatives. Under capacity building, we have four thematic areas, and um, the project must address one or more of these thematic areas. So the first one is the promotion of common value, non-discrimination, and gender, gender equality through sport. Second one is the development of skills to improve social involvement of disadvantaged groups. Then we have the integration of migrants, and a fourth thematic area is the post-conflict uh, reconciliation. The action is primarily, primarily targeting association, NGOs, and more generally, non-for-profit organizations active in the field of sport. They can be based in EU member states or countries associated to the program, and in countries not associated to the program from Region 1. Region 1 being Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo and Montenegro. For-profit organization can be involved if clear added value is um, demonstrated in the project. However, in order to respect the capacity, obje the capacity objective of the action, coordination tasks must be carried out by non-for-profit organizations. Here we have the rules in order to, uh, to present an eligible consortium. So the main rule is that you need to have four organizations from three countries. And then you have additional requirements. So you need to have one organization from two different EU member states or country associated. You need to have also two organizations from at least one country from region one. And in total, you cannot have more organizations from an EU or associated country than organizations from countries in Region 1. Regarding the conditions, um, all activities must take place in the countries um, of the organizations involved and the same exceptions apply as for collaborative partnerships, that is that you can have an, an activity based at the seat of a European institution, and uh, if the activity is in, uh, involved promotion of result, it can also take place at a thematic event. Also, the, the project that you present needs to focus on one of the four thematic uh, criteria that uh, we described, so values, skills, migrant, or reconciliation. And your project must last, must have a period ranging from 12 to 36 months. Our last action is the not-for-profit European sport event. The aim is to support organizations of the organization of sport events with a European dimension in the following field. So the project has to focus on one of the four um, priorities um, presented here. So that can be volunteering in sport, social inclusion through sport, 
fight against discrimination in sport, including gender equality, and encouraging the participation in sports and physical activity. In order to be eligible, the organization must be active in the field of sport and based in a EU member state or country associated to the program. The consortium conditions um, are different depending on the type of lump sum that you request. It's a type of event. We will see that um, in the next slide. All activities must take place in the country of the organization involved. And in, for this action, there is absolutely no exception. And the duration must be chosen between a 12 month or an 18 month period. That must be chosen at the application stage. Here are, the, uh, here are the different types of events that uh, you need to, the, that you will have to choose from. First of all, you have the European wide event. This action is a mono beneficiary action, so there is only one applicant, no partner, no associated partner, and this applicant has uh, nine participating organizations involved presented in the application. Um, overall. These 10 organizations, the applicant and the nine participating organizations, must come from 10 different countries. And the event will take place in the, in the country of the, the applicant uh, participation. So important to note here, the nine participating organizations will not be listed in your budget and, uh, or even in the e-form. It will not appear in the contract. Nevertheless, it's important in order to ensure your eligibility that you describe these um, this, uh, organizations in your application. In the description of your project, we need to see that you have um, nine participating organizations on board. Then we have the Type 1 European local event. It's um, to be eligible, you need to come up with, uh, you need to be uh, as part of your consortium, three to five partner organizations, and each coming from different countries. And the event must take place in the countries of each organization. The support for this type of event would be 200,000 euros. And then we have the type two European local event, so it's bigger. And it's, uh, it involves minimum six partner organizations from six different countries. If you have more than six partner organizations, they can still come from six different countries. So you don't have, it doesn't, the, the, the stake doesn't uh, get higher as uh, you have more partners, as long as you have at least six minimum organizations from six minimum countries. And uh, the events must take place in the country, in one of the country, uh, in the country, sorry, of each um, organization. The support for this uh, type of event is 300,000 euros. Tomorrow you will have a full presentation on the funding mechanism but since I'm presenting the, the actions here, um, I give you um, a peek on the, on the situation and uh, gathering, um, I mean, summarizing um, the, the, difference, uh, the different applicable rules. So for the, the three actions that were already in place uh, last year, cooperation partnerships, small-scale partnerships, and not-for-profit organization, we have prefixed lump sum. They correspond to the total budget of the grant. And you, so you have here the different support that can be requested. Be careful that the not-for-profit uh, lump sum is linked to um, eligibility criteria, in the sense that you need to have the, um, the partners uh, on board for each type, the, the right number of partners on board for each type of, uh, of lump sum. Please bear in mind that no other amount can be supported, so please don't apply with other amounts than the one that you see on that screen for these applications. Then a second type of lump sum 
is uh, the one that we will apply for capacity building. It's a lump sum based on budget and evaluation. So the lump sum, it can be a different lump sum um, uh, for, fixed for each grant. It rep represents a maximum of 80% of the budget submitted and it, it should be between 100,000 and 200,000 euros. So it becomes a lump sum from the, from the application, from the, the contracting stage. Here we have the, the timeline. So the cooperation partnerships, the small scale partnerships and the not-for-profit event have a deadline on the 23rd of March. The 7th of April deadline is for the capacity building action. We foresee to do the eligibility check and evaluation process between April and September, and we hope to uh, come back to a normal um, calendar and be able to give you the results and prepare the grants uh, in November, in December. As you, will, as you will also see tomorrow, the grant preparation is a, is a different step than in the past. So we will, uh, it inv as it involves the, 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 uh, the, the beneficiaries to draw up the final uh, conditions of their agreement. So this period is, um, uh, can take time. Before we open the floor to question, I would like to give you uh, a small piece of advice. So we are engaging in the second year in the e-grant environment. So I felt important to share some tips based on the most common errors made in 2021. As not only these errors create undue delays in the selection process, but worst of all, some of these mistakes lead to the automatic rejection of projects. So first, be careful to choose the right action. If you apply by mistake under cooperation partnerships with two participating organizations, your project will be ineligible. You might have wanted to apply for small-scale participation, so be careful you click on the right action. It's a very easy mistake to make, but it's also an easy one enough, easy enough to, to avoid that type of mistake. Also, Choose the right lump sum. Choose the one that is proposed and because we cannot award any other amount. The system in the e-grant lets you has a free field so you can put any amount, but please use the lump sum that, uh, that is allowed. And this lump sum must be in your budget form. Make sure that your request in the e-form is the request in your budget form. In, I must point out that in 2021, out of um, 1,300 applications, we had 25% of inconsistencies between the, e the request in the e-form and the request in the budget form. Also, um, read carefully the eligibility criteria, duration, place of venues, size of consortium, nationalities of participants. They are all clearly stated in the program guide. We cannot circumvent the rules. So, no matter how good your project is, if it doesn't pass the eligibility criteria, it will not get a chance to get assessed and support it. We are aware that these projects might be difficult to set up, that the application system might be complex, above all for first-time applicants. But there is a lot of material available to help you through. So my last advice is to listen carefully to the presentations that will be made to you tomorrow, to start early and take time to read the guidance. The presentations of today and tomorrow will be available on our website. They also constitute a useful source of information. I hope that this info day will be constructive for you and to prepare very good projects and that will, uh, project that uh, hopefully we will be able to support. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Gael, for this, uh, this presentation about all the possibilities uh, given by the Erasmus Plus program in the field of sport and also for the advices which are 
very useful because uh, uh, that's true that our common interest is to have good projects uh, because we are all at the end uh, working in the same direction and promoting sport and physical activity in the dif different dimensions. So it's always a, 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 a pity to be, uh, le le let's say, to be confronted with uh, mistakes, let's say, which could have been easily avoided. So it's very important to have this in uh, this, uh, let's say, tips in mind. But we will have two days to discuss this and to make a more, uh, dis to have more discussion in-depth discussion on this. Before uh, starting with the questions, I would uh, invite, we have the chance here to have the, the president of Luciano Di Fonso who is a sort of uh, Pope of Erasmus Plus uh, sport. So it would be very good, Luciano, to have uh, some first comments or you, from you or some additional advice uh, on the basis of your long and fruitful experience in the field of Erasmus Plus sport. So Luciano, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve. It's, it's a pleasure to stay with, with you, although not physically present. Uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to be in this, in this room. Already it's so empty that it's very strange to talk in an empty audience. Uh, but I saw that you are already very active also in our app, uh, Connects Me. Uh, a lot of messages I saw, exchange, uh, looking for some partners. So this is exactly what was the idea when we launched the aim for days, is that you, is an opportunity for you physically, but also online to have contact with other organizations, to establish partnerships, mm -hmm. and to have new ideas in terms of, of, of projects. Uh, of course, it's also, the, if I can say, the, 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 normal, the normal period eh, for, for the info day. Last year we were very, very late. Today and this year we hope that we will uh, start again with the normal a program for the for the sport uh, projects and the application selection process. So today, as usual, we had the info day at the end of January, beginning of February. So to, again, this year. So we really hope that we have still this uh, opportunity uh, today and to come to different um, different period compared to, la to last year. What is also very surprising every year for us is that also the number of the, mm, we have 1,500 uh, registered, or then we have the web streaming, and what is really interesting is also the fact that we, again, we have a lot of people participating in this event that didn't apply last year or in the past, which represent almost, yeah, almost uh, more than 50% which is a good news for us. It means that we have still have a new organization interesting in the program, a growing interest in our uh, sport chapter in Erasmus Plus, and this is also uh, important. Of course, this is, means also that we have a lot of applications as it was uh, last year. So the, 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 the situation now is a highly competitive uh, uh, process, but we hope, especially already this year, but in the future also to increase our budget and to try also to increase the success rate for, for the future. So I think tomorrow will be also a very important day with all the different information. Do not hesitate also to put your questions on, the, on Connect Me. We will try to, to also to answer today and tomorrow to your question to try also to answer directly in, in, in the hub. Uh, just really follow the advice that Gahel just gave in, the, in their presentation. Uh, it, it's very important that you pay attention in all documents, in all form. Last year we experienced a new uh, submission system. I know that for some of, of you could be complicated. Also for us, it's been not easy to work with a new tool. But I hope really that in the future and also this year we can have a, a better improvement in the system and in your knowledge and expertise, as it is for us also to work with, uh, with this tool. I think that for the moment we can maybe even launch a start with uh, if there is some questions from, from the audience, and then we will see if we can also continue mm -hmm. with some things. OK. OK, thank you, Luciano. Uh, so let's start with uh, part of the question. We have uh, more or less half an hour to do to do this. 
Uh, and I see that I must turn like this uh, to, to read the question. Uh, the first one is from Christine, C Christiana Mondriotu. Does anyone know where we can find the guidance? Any link to find it? Thank you. Um, do we start with this one or we take... Uh, okay, let's start with this one and we will see. Uh, Gael, do you want to, to intervene on this? When, when you are on the, on the participant portal, you will see a guide to applicants. So you will have access to that. Uh, that's a, a guide to, um, to, to find its way in the, in the submission system. And then you have also you will have soon the the, the presentation on the agency website. Merci, Gaël. Uh, let's take uh, the following one. If there is one, uh, we are waiting for it to arrive. For the time being, it's the same one which is uh, on the screen. Uh, you want to add something on this? Yeah. yeah. Just maybe uh, I can add what Gail said that it's true that in the past everything was in our website, uh, the program guide, all the uh, all the presentation and things. But now, since last year, that we have the the uh, funding attend opportunity portals is true that all information are in this uh, portal. So you have to search within the portal in Erasmus Plus in the sport and you will have the different action and you will find the program guide and the different also uh, information. On the contrary for what it depends of the presentation, the video of these two days, we will have um, our, all this presentation in our website. So you have to go to the agency website and you will find in the following days some additional uh, information. Thank you, Luciano. Thank you, Luciano. And now I see on the screen that the second one uh, just arrived. Uh, this one is from Nadia Brahimi. Would it be possible in the future to decentralize small scale partnerships within sport to the national agencies so that it would be easier to include new grassroots organizations. Uh, on this, maybe and I will make uh, myself uh, uh, a, a comment. Uh, the idea in the new generation of program is this uh, program 2021-2027 is to have some actions decentralized. One clearly is the future mobility action, which was not implemented still, but which will be uh, in the future. Uh, so there will be, compared to the past, actions decentralized. In the first generation of program, all sports actions were uh, dealt with in Brussels. Now some actions, mobility, for instance, will be decentralized. Concerning the small scale partnerships, let's say no decision is taken and, uh, and uh, the, it remains open because there are arguments in favor, there are arguments again. Uh, uh, Nadia, you mentioned that it would, could be easier to include new grassroots organizations, that's, uh, that's an argument. On the other side, uh, in order to be decentralized, an action must have uh, a volume which is enough in terms of uh, finance. If we, you have uh, an, under a certain level of uh, money, it's better to keep it in Brussels, either to give very small shares in different member states. So this is a debate for the small collaborative partnerships. For instance, for next year, if I remember correctly, we will have, for this year, 2022, we will have 9.5 million euros for, for these small collaborative partnerships. My view is that at this size, is too small to decentralize it. One day, maybe, the discussion will be reopened. It will be reopened not only within the Commission, but also in the, with the Member States and the Parliament, which have their words to, to say. So this, is a reason, so this is the answer now. For the time being, in the very short term, 
uh, no. Next year, it will continue to be under Brussels, uh, let's say, uh, management. In the future, uh, we will see. Uh, anything to add on this? Or let's come to the go to this next question. Alors, let's. So this one is from uh, Yigit Kobanoglu. Could you please inform that if the project cost will be 250,000, will you support only uh, 200,000 as an Erasmus? Who wants to, to intervene on, on this? Luciano? Or Gael? Luciano. Luciano. I, I guess that we are talking here about the capacity building uh, action because it is in the capacity building that we have these 80% uh, of the total cost of a project. And so if you wish to have 200,000 euro applying for a capacity building project, in this case, yeah, the total cost of the project is, must be 250. Uh, this is more or less or something. <laughs> For concerning the other action, this is a fixed lump sum. So the 80% is already calculated. So if you uh, go for 200,000 euro or 300,000 euro of the, of the lump sum, the uh, co-financing is already calculated in this lump sum. So you just have to request exactly the amount indicated in the different lump sum according to the different, to the different action. So I don't know, Gael, if you want to add something, but it's... Okay, fine. Thank you, Luciano. Next question, please. With the technology, we always have to wait a couple of seconds before they appear. Uh, it's arriving slowly. Voila. A question by Mr. Sergio Cortes. I understand that a consortium formed by public organizations working alongside non-for-profit sport clubs and civil society organizations are eligible for collaborative partnerships or small-scale collaborative partnerships, right? Who wants to intervene? Gael, please. I'll, I'll reply in the... the the watch of uh, Luciano, but uh, if I understand well, uh, yes, I mean, this is any type of organization is eligible. And uh, for some actions, be careful that they need to be, applicants need to be, um, to be active in the field of sport. So please check the award criteria because it depends on the, on the, the type of, ah, no, you're to talking about collaborative partnerships. So indeed, uh, let me just check. Sorry. Yeah, you can. I, you confirm that it's possible. I, I think the question, if I well understood, it means there is no difference between not for profit and the other action. So, all organizations, there is no distinction that public cannot participate only not for profit and civil society only for collaborative partnership or small collaborative partnership. All organizations can apply for all the actions, including the capacity building. Eh? There is no distinction between private and public, between sport and other NGOs organizations. So, it's open for all kinds of organizations. Okay, thank, thank you, Luciano. And this is, a, and this is a, an, yes, we, you, you, we can uh, move questions, but uh, this is a very important point because uh, uh, one characteristic of our sport part of the program is that it's very open to all kinds of organizations. They must have a link to sport. This is really the, uh, the, 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 the basis, but otherwise it's extremely open. Uh, we were, uh, at the beginning of the program, very pleased to have uh, new organizations and new kind of organizations and bodies uh, arriving in our Erasmus Plus program. Now our challenge is to uh, organize a balance, let's say, have a, a sort of balance between different kinds of organizations, not to have, for instance, I don't know, NGOs overrepresented or universities overrepresented. So this is just a question of balance between our different partners, but all sort of organizations are welcome 
to, to, to participate. Huh? Uh, now uh, I see the next question, Ljubko uh, Mi Mihailovsky. For the type one and type two non-for-profit European sport events, how many of the three, six countries need to be EU countries and how many can be Western Balkans and other partner countries? Yeah, true that there are different uh, scenarios. Do you want uh, Gael to intervene? For eligibility on the European sport events, so it's open to EU countries and countries associated to the program, and all these countries are eligible, so there is no restriction um, whether you need to have part, uh, part of the consortium being in third country or in uh, countries associated to the program, as long as it's um, eligible. It's, uh, yeah, no other requirements. So, need, so to the question, need, uh, and how many can be for Western Balkans or other part partner countries, as long as your, all your, partici your, your, your participants are based in, an in a country associated to the program, they're ineligible, and you can have as many as you want. Absolutely, just to clarify, so the Western Balkans here, we are talking only on the countries that are uh, signed an agreement with the European Commission, with the European Union, so it's the only two countries that are associated to the program, which is Serbia and the Republic of North Macedonia. The other countries are not, are not eligible from Western Balkans, eh? but is for the capacity building action, yes, but not for this not-for-profit European sport events. Eh? This is, must be clear. Eh? So we are talking about, as Gael said, EU member states and the third country associated to the program. So the two from the Western Balkans, all the other countries that are third countries, but they are associated and they are eligible. All the others are not eligible for this action. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can find the full list in, uh, in the program guide. In, uh, in the part A of the program guide, there is the full list of associated countries to the program. Thank you, Gael and Luciano. Uh, and now we have a question by Jacqueline cronenburg edela What is the most important goal that you hope to reach with capacity building. So I will give again the, the floor to, uh, to Gael or Luciano. I would just say myself one thing, is that this new action is a little bit a symbol of the opening of the program to, uh, to non-EU countries and to non-program countries. You know that at the very beginning of the program eight years ago, uh, we were very uh, EU and program countries centered, and more and more, because there was a political wish from the Commission, and because also there was an important request from our stakeholders, uh, from you, from the Member States, from Parliament, uh, our program b became more open, much more open to international cooperation in the sport part. It was a case already in education and youth. In sport, it was not so much open. And now we have opened it much more. And this is a little bit a, a symbol of the new possibilities of cooperation which are given. But uh, Gael, can you uh, on this uh, complement uh, on what are the precise goals and maybe Luciano later? So. Yes, sure. Um, indeed, the idea is to, to be inclusive towards these, uh, the organization in these, um, uh, in these countries and help them benefit from, the, from a European support. And with this support, maybe to, yeah, to, to make it, um, to make it a, a step into transnational projects, uh, to help them secure a network with European organization and also on their own territory to to encourage the um, to encourage the practice of sport uh, and bring all the values that uh, uh, sport can bring uh, uh, regarding uh, social uh, inclusion of uh, or equal opportunities so with this action the aim is really to bring them uh, with us in, uh, in making sport uh, yeah, part of the society. 
Yeah, I think it's really uh, is the, the the name of the of the action, which is very important to take into consideration. So the capacity building is uh, the main goal, as we said, is really to uh, to increase the capacity building of the organization in that countries, which is in the region in, in region one. Uh, it's it's this is the first time that in the, the Erasmus Plus uh, sport program we have an action in which countries not associated to the program can be the applicant. Huh? This is it's really, really important. Huh? It's the first time, and it's important so that this action is mainly dedicated to these countries and this organization. Is it true that organizations from member states can participate, must participate, can be also the applicant, but the main goal, I should say, I would say it's really to increase the capacity of this organization in, in that country. And this is also why in this action you can have also regional cooperation among countries that they, they belong of the same area, which is really also important because we can have also third country associated to the program like Serbia, North Macedonia, that they can be a partner without a new member states of this action. So this is for me is the really main goal of this action. Thank you, Luciano. And now we have a question by Rafaela Lioce. Is it a new established organization? Is a new established organization eligible as partner? Gael, please. The, the simple answer is yes. Nothing else to add. Yes, it's eligible. There is no restriction on the establishment. Thank you. Thank you, Gael. Uh, simple answer. Uh, now the next one. Just again waiting a little bit for the next one. Ah, voila. Uh, Laura Maria Tidla asks, is there any consideration that this year's 23rd of March deadline will be extended if last year's results are only coming out six weeks uh, before. And uh, I, will, uh, I, I, I will myself uh, uh, answer uh, at this question. We are at this stage not considering any extension of deadlines. Uh, in principle, let's say this uh, hypothesis that is uh, uh, I will say it in other words. Um, le, um, in principle, uh, what I just said before uh, uh, should be respected. In, uh, in the three coming weeks, we will have results. Uh, but in any case, uh, this will not have an impact of the deadline of the 23rd uh, of March. Uh, we can never say that it will not happen, but this is not considered at the time being. You remember that last year there was an extension of deadlines based mainly on two reasons. First, that the time given to sport organizations and stakeholders was a really short to prepare a good application. At the end, we had many, but uh, um, so first argument, it was very short. And second argument, it was we had some technical issues also concerning the application forms. And this was putting some organizations in difficulty. We didn't want to penalize them. So, at, so we decided uh, this extension. So this may happen from time to time. This year, there is, we see a priori no reason why we should extend the, the deadlines. So. so next question, please. Uh, Mahen Saoklik asks, hi all, does Mauritius form part of this program? Uh, Gael, clearly not a program country, but uh, Gael or Luciano, do you want to comment? This doesn't impede from participating or being part of the... It must be yeah. considered if it's a, I don't think it's a country related to uh, 
territoire d'Outre-mer or other, other countries. Uh, I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't think so. But of course, as I said, Erasmus Plus sport program it's for the co co collaborative cooperation partnership partnership for cooperation is open all over the world so all countries can participate whole organization for our countries the only limitation is that they cannot be in the minimum requirements for the eligibility so in the uh, partnership for cooperation you must have a three minimum three organization from member states or third country associated to the program in addition to these three uh, organization three countries you can have also uh, countries outside the European Union uh, but of course we need uh, the expert will evaluate the added value of this country in the project and if it's this is not demonstrated the participation of this country can be taken out from the partnership and from the actions so the project will continue to be supported but without the participation of a third countries if this is not uh, demonstrated the added value of the, its participation. Thank you, thank you, Luciano. But you know, a priori, uh, one message is also that a priori, uh, on in certain conditions, all countries from all the, the world can, in a way, be involved in one action of the of, of the program. The fact of being, uh, I don't know, uh, an organization from uh, 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 China, India, uh, whatever country, is not uh, per se uh, per, per se a reason not to be able to participate. Huh? And we have partners. We have more and more partners from from. Uh, uh, countries outside the EU, outside the program, of countries non-associated to the program. Now we have a question from Anna Te Tejero. Can sporting events be integrated into a small scale collaboration? Gael? As long as it's, uh, I mean, the Sport event must be an organization. So, an, any organization can, can take part in the small scale collaboration, and depending on the activities foreseen, if they comply with the small scale um, collaboration project's uh, uh, priorities, there is no restriction what, what type of um, organization that is. Uh, yes, absolutely. I can also add that normally. A small scale, you know, you can have two countries as a minimum, uh, and is of course uh, the main objective is, is to have an exchange of best practice and idea. But of course, the idea to have also a sporting events organized within this uh, action can be also, of course, uh, included. It can be also interesting to to organize so that we have an exchange between different. We have a lot of small collaborative parties, for example, work in the field of social inclusion and refugees. Uh, through football, there are sports clubs in different countries, they exchange their experience, their ideas, and then at the end of the project, they organize a small tournament, a small sporting events with the whole participation of the different athletes, football clubs of the different countries. So this is a typical example that can be absolutely to be covered by the grant and the lump sum, including some equipment for the different sport club, sport organization in, involved. Thank you, uh, Luciano, Gael. Uh, we have uh, five minutes more to, to finish our session, so we can still maybe have uh, two, three, four, uh, two, three questions. Alors, Alice Bourny, question, dear Mr. Yves Le Lostec, dear Luciano Difonso, gender equality has been a priority for a while now. Could it be the time to think about a cluster meeting to check on annual impact and outcomes reached. Thanks. Uh, I will uh, give the floor to, to my colleagues, but I will uh, also maybe give you a, 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 first, uh, a first comment. Uh, gender equality has been a priority for a while now. True, uh, true. We have many projects on gender equality, promoting gender equality, and we have many projects where the gender equality dimension 
is taken uh, into account and is an added value to the project. Could you think about a cluster meeting to check on actual impact and outcomes reached? Uh, I would make two comments on this. First, you know that uh, during the last years, uh, the agency has had the tradition to, in cooperation with the Commission, to organize a cluster meeting in order to precisely uh, to analyze projects, to, to check their impact, to discuss also with member states and parliament what to do with uh, what had been produced with projects. We interrupted a little bit these cluster meetings due to COVID. Now, hopefully, in the coming uh, months or years, it will be reopened, and the questions of the subject will be reopened. So this is a good suggestion. I cannot give any answer uh, now, but uh, thank you for this suggestion. My, my additional comment on this will be to, that it would be good also to, to, to discuss with my colleagues who are in the room uh, from the, uh, the Commission, because you know that there is a very important work which has been done on gender equality. There has been a high-level group uh, which has met and which has just produced, or which will, uh, which will come uh, with some ideas uh, uh, very, very soon. Uh, and on this, maybe there will be some discussion to to, to know. Uh, to discuss what to do with this suggestion. So it would be good also not only to discuss with us, the agency, and we can have part of the answer, but also to discuss with, uh, with our colleagues from uh, and, uh, the Commission about uh, the future plans concerning the promotion of gender equality in sport. Uh, additional uh, comment uh, on this, uh, Luciano? Maybe we can say that, in fact, I don't know, it's, it's a secret, but I can really, we, it's among us, so I can say something about this. But in fact, we, we already planned, uh, we are, it's almost ready, a cluster meeting on a broader context, which is social inclusion, in which one of the aspects is the gender equality already prepared from us since probably 2020. Yeah? But of course, then we were touched by what is uh, happening in 2020, 2021 and uh, the beginning of this year. So that's why, because we think we could launch a cluster meeting even, I don't know, in one month. So, or, 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 although Gael will kill me, or I'm, I'm sure, but just to say that we can do online without any problem. But as, in particular for this cluster meeting, what does it mean for us, this cluster meeting, which is the exchange, the physical participation and exchange, it's really important. That's why we keep this program in our table and we hope that in the future we can have uh, possibilities to have a uh, physical participation in a meeting because in a cluster meeting it's really important to have this kind of exchange. So the idea has Eve confirmed we have it, we will continue to organize, to put together the results of the project with the uh, policy makers, with the different institutions and the, the idea is to continue but of course Last year we had a very difficult year. Uh, this year we are paying again an impact. Uh, the late publication uh, of the results is an example. Uh, so this year will be also a bit complicated in this part of the year, but we will certainly have the idea to continue to organize this, this kind of meetings in the future. Okay, thank you, Luciano. So, dear Alice, I, I hope it answers to your question. By the, by the way, I saw that uh, Luciano gave you uh, a secret information in the presence of 5,000 witnesses, but <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true that it is already, uh, it is already uh, almost, almost uh, known that we will do this. I think it will be probably the last question. Uh, and uh, this question, comes from Yuris Riskins. Uh, question, do you somehow evaluate financial capacity of the coordinators or partners? Can financial capacity play some role in evaluation? Gael? So the evaluation for is first made on the, on the project, on the, on the, on the proposal. And then if uh, projects that are pre-selected 
are then uh, required to submit um, their financial details and financial capacity is um, determined at that point. And based on the results of the financial capacity, um, the agency could decide to, to say that there is no pre-financing payment in order to reduce the risk. But um, a weak financial capacity will not affect the, 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 the selection, uh, the initial selection of, um, of the project. Thank you, Gael. Um, I'm afraid it's now time to, to close our, our session, our first session on uh, the general presentation of the, of the program. Um, so thank you for all of you, for all those who asked the question, which help us also think and, uh, and, uh, and explain a little bit more about the program. Uh, thanks to, to Gael and, uh, and Luciano to have uh, presented and answered the, the questions. Uh, in any case, it's not the end of the questions. We will have uh, two days for, for this and, uh, and, uh, na and the next session and tomorrow morning will be decisive again to go deeper in the discussions. Now we are just going to make a half an hour break and we will restart at 11.30 Brussels time, so in half an hour more or less, uh, with the policy session which will be moderated by uh, Flo van Hood, the, the head of the sport unit in the European Commission. Thanks a lot and have a nice break.
Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Flor van Hout. I'm very happy to, um, to welcome you to this policy panel on European sport policy. Um, European policy is about uh, working together. Uh, it's about like teamwork um, in sport. European policy is about cooperating with member states, with stakeholders, bringing partners together. And here is very much where the policy meets Erasmus+, Plus, because of course, thanks to the project, thanks to the partnerships and events, it's not only us driving the process, but we do it together with you, with the stakeholders, with the Erasmus Plus family. And how that works in practice, I will first ask my colleague Stefano to uh, give you an insight into um, our activities in uh, sport and what are the recent priorities. Stefano, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And... Uh uh, good morning to all the friends uh, of the sport movement. Uh, my name is uh, Stefano Pintus and I'm a policy officer in the uh, sport unit. Uh, just waiting for the slides to start, but uh, in today's presentation, the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I will be uh, going through the main elements of the uh, youth sport policy. We'll see the priorities and, uh, of course, we will concentrate more on the healthy lifestyle for all. Um, I start with uh, my first slide, and uh, that is about uh, the basis of uh, sport. As you know, um, each policy in the European Union uh, needs to be uh, based on uh, uh, an article from the treaty of, of, from the treaties, and that is uh, Article 165 for us. However, uh, beyond uh, the basic law, we also have other documents that help us in. Uh, uh, becoming more um, uh, more effective and work well between uh, the European Union, the EU institutions more in general, member states, and the stakeholders. That is specifically the uh, EU work plan for sport. And uh, we have two big highlights uh, for 2021, and that is a launch of two expert groups on recovery from COVID-19 and uh, green sport. That is uh, very um, very important. We also have peer learning activities and other events. Uh, if you're interested in this document, don't hesitate to look for it on the internet. Uh, it is present on our Eurlex and uh, you can find more uh, information um, uh, about that. Now, uh, going to the second slide, uh, we have the three pillars of the uh, EU World Plan for Sport. Uh, as you can see, uh, that is about integrity and values, about socioeconomic and environmental dimension, and about health financing physical activity. So we structure all of our, all of our activities into these uh, three, uh, three uh, key fields. As you will see, uh, the Erasmus Plus priorities, they are also uh, very much interconnected. Going uh, to the next slide, uh, we see that uh, we have um, a much higher budget compared to the past, and uh, especially because the first year of a new programming period has a dip in the budget, but that goes up uh, in, the year, uh, in the year after. And especially uh, the small uh, cooperation partnerships and the not-for-profit sport events are the two that are uh, receiving the highest, uh, the highest increase, as you can see uh, on the screen. We also welcome to the family, if you want, the uh, capacity building in the field of sport. So if you are an organization that uh, is working or wishes to work with the Western Balkans, uh, you are definitely uh, very welcome to have a look at it and, uh, and maybe send an application. Here uh, we have the priorities. Uh, as you will see, they didn't change very, very much compared to last year. The big change is uh, in the right-hand side of your, um, of your screen on the uh, orange box at the top. That we have the uh, promoting health, uh, um, yes, um, healthy lifestyles for all. This is uh, our new priority that is here to accommodate the Healthy Lifestyle Pro for All initiative that was sent uh, by Commissioner uh, Gabriel in September uh, of 2021. So you will see uh, traditional sport and games, for instance, it's all, uh, it, it is still there. So no big change uh, on this slide. 
moving forward, we have uh, pilot projects and preparatory action. One, you know it already, it's uh, um, grassroots uh, infrastructure innovation. And we have a new one, which is uh, people and planet. If you recall uh, the previous slide on socioeconomic and environmental dimension, you see we are very much progressing into, uh, into this field. And uh, you will know more about this uh, in the upcoming months. Uh, in terms of events, we are at the beginning of the year, that is the uh, Sport Info Day, and we have still four big events uh, upcoming. One is the uh, Be Inclusive Awards that are taking place in roughly three months from now, the, um, the U Sport Forum, which is taking place uh, in June, we have the uh, U uh, European Week of Sport, always taking place between the 30, 23rd and 30th of September of every year, uh, from 2021, we could count on uh, uh, millions of participants and tens of thousands of events. And we always conclude the year with the uh, Be Active Awards that uh, close. Now, um, as Commissioner Gabriel said, the Healthy Lifestyle for All is a new big initiative. Uh, it follows the Tartu call on a healthy lifestyle uh, that ran uh, a few years ago, but it, it also last two years. However, this call uh, is somehow different. It is about co-creation. So if you are a very small uh, sport club, or if you are a big federation, if you are a, a small village or a township, or if you are a government, uh, there, uh, you, and if you have a good idea about um, an initiative on healthy lifestyles, uh, you can be part of it. We will see that uh, in just a minute. As Commissioner uh, Gabriel anticipated, the Healthy Lifestyle for All is organized around three uh, key priorities. And uh, you can send uh, a pledge in each one uh, of these priorities separately. That means that if you have um, a good idea about um, promotion uh, of healthy lifestyles and uh, giving information about healthy lifestyles, uh, there you can uh, send a pledge in this field. It is important to note that uh, this calls uh, to all generations because from the kids to the elderly, uh, they all need uh, to do uh, physical activity and they have different needs, so that can cater uh, for that. Uh, second priority is about access to sport uh, and physical activity with a special link uh, on inclusion and non-discrimination. That is because we uh, we discover that uh, sometimes there is a willingness, but the infrastructure is just not there, and maybe you have a good idea, so you can pledge uh, in this respect. The third one is about um, a holistic approach, so it's a system. Uh, you can think of a Healthy Lifestyle for All as a way to send a pledge, uh, not only for, um, for doing more sport, but also to include uh, health, nutrition, and well-being, including, of course, uh, mental well-being. Sometimes it's just not enough to do, uh, to do more sport. We also need to think of other, uh, of other elements. Uh, moving forward, that's uh, a little bit the practical part. So a pledge is an initiative that you are sending. It will be yours, and you will implement it until uh, December of next year. So we still have almost two years to go. And the idea behind uh, a pledge board is to show what you're doing. So the 45 pledges that are present uh, today, uh, they show uh, showed where they are, who they are, uh, uh, who they are addressed to, and um, where uh, you can uh, probably uh, participate to that. Uh, again, it is important to note that there is uh, no uh, hierarchy of scale. Uh, you can have your uh, pledge sent to um, a small sport club as uh, at the European wide level. Uh, everything counts. We, um, we believe that there is a sort of a, um, a need to be spread uh, in each community and everyone uh, can, be, uh, can be part of it and can be, uh, can be targeted and can gain from that. Now, um, getting to the probably the most uh, complicated part, that is about um, what a pledge is and how to uh, and how it works compared to Erasmus Plus. As you recall, I, um, uh, there is a new priority. 
So you don't need to be part of Erasmus Plus to send a pledge. You can send your own individual pledge. You can do it now. Uh, if you are um, an applicant, an interested applicant to Erasmus Plus, you can send uh, already a pledge, an initiative. This will give you already some visibility. And uh, if you are already implementing an Erasmus Plus project, you can think already of sending, uh, of sending your pledge as well and to give more visibility to the initiative you are already ongoing. The main difference between the two is that uh, for sending a pledge or for implementing a pledge, there is no budget provided. Uh, that is just for Erasmus. So um, it is uh, a little bit up to you to decide in which, uh, in which level you want to, uh, to operate and where, uh, you can, um, and where you can best send your, um, your own input. In terms of, um, of pledges, you are definitely invited to do it uh, now. There is a link in this, uh, in this description. And uh, there is more information uh, in the website Healthy Lifestyle for All that will allow you to see what is already being done, uh, who are the pledgers right now, and uh, any other uh, important question. We will uh, read your pledge, we will get back in, uh, to you if there is any question, and uh, finally, they will, all, uh, they will be published, um, according to our specification, of course. Now, uh, my presentation is coming to a close. Here, uh, you can get in uh, touch with us via uh, Twitter or Facebook, where this event is also web streamed. And uh, here there is the link to the Healthy Lifestyle for All, where you can have a look uh, at all the questions and all the pledges and more information. We are, of course, available to reply to questions should you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, Stefano, for this uh, presentation. I hope it's all clear what we from the European Commission do to um, promote a European dimension in sport and European sport policy. Um, now, I said sport policy is teamwork, so we work together very much with um, stakeholders, with member states to um, uh, realize these ideas and also to implement further and ensure that, uh, that these reach out to um, everyone in Europe from the top international organizations down to the bottom at grassroots level. As Stefan also said, this is something where everyone can get involved. And here in our panel, I have um, four distinguished guests who will today with me look at some of the um, issues that are on our agenda right now. On the one hand, of course, how to overcome the difficulties that uh, we're still facing because of the COVID-19 pandemic that unfortunately is still with us. And on the other hand, also, uh, how to uh, stakeholders and member states can um, uh, carry forward this idea, this notion of promoting healthy lifestyles for all. So let me present um, our distinguished guests. So first here on my left, I have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, Gloria Viseras, who was at the age of 15 a national champion in gymnastics. We're very impressed and you've also competed in the Olympics. So uh, we're very happy to have you here uh, with us, uh, Gloria. But you're here also to talk about your work you did after around safe sport, uh, protection of um, children and minors, and having uh, sport in a respectful way. And you've done a lot of projects, uh, Erasmus, you have a lot of experience, and uh, I'm very happy that you will share some of it today here with us. Then here, further on my left, is uh, Mr. Jean Gracia, who is the first vice president of uh, European Athletics, which is the um, European organization organizing uh, athletics competitions. And notably, uh, Jean, you were in charge of um, organizing the um, European Athletics Championship uh, in 2020 in France. And of course, uh, this was 2020, a very difficult year, and um, we look forward also to learning from your experience on how to cope as a sport federation in this incredibly difficult time with constraints and where you have to adapt and uh, sometimes take difficult decisions. But uh, we look forward to hearing your story. Now I turn to my right, and there is Heidi Sulander, who is the Councillor for Education, Culture, Audiovisual, Youth and Sport, a mouthful, Heidi, um, in the permanent representation of, uh, of Finland. 
and uh, you have chaired the Sport Working Party a couple of years ago. You're also following sport policy and giving the Finnish input to our European cooperation. So we're also very happy that you're here to give us your insight from the side of uh, one of our member states. And then lastly, I have in the cloud somewhere um, Eva Glibo, who is unfortunately not with us here uh, in the room, but she will join our panel discussion from Munich. And uh, Eva is a committee member of ENGZO Youth, which is an NGO working for youth participation and the voice of young people in, in sport. She's also um, representing the Croatian Olympic uh, Committee. And in ENGZO, she's uh, the lead of the health working group where she fo focuses on youth mental health, which as we all know, uh, has been uh, heavily uh, affected by the uh, uh, long time of the pandemic that we're living uh, right now. So thank you very much for being here. We're very happy. And my first question actually goes to, um, to Heidi, because uh, you have the responsibility of, um, uh, not you, but your country, of um, supporting sport activities in your country. And how have you been able to motivate sport clubs to keep up and not to <clears throat> let themselves down by all the difficulties in, in the various nature, by not being able to practice, by not being able to organize activities, to still continue this very important work, because of course, sport is maybe more important than ever, Heidi. Thank you, Flor, and thank you for the invitation here. It's great that this great event goes on, uh, despite uh, the difficult times. So very good to be here today. Uh, I must say that uh, even if I'm representing government point of view, I'm sure that we all share the aim to keep people active uh, in all ages and able to enjoy sports uh, also during pandemia. It's not always easy job, uh, but we will only see in the future how well we did when we get more data. But at the moment it seems that at least in Finland we have managed to avoid kind of a mass escape uh, from sport clubs and restrictions have even brought new people uh, into sports, especially outdoor sports, uh, both on snow and ice, as well as uh, in forest in summer, are highly popular in Finland at the moment. And at least my social media seems to be full of uh, photos of uh, touring, skating on lakes at the moment, and also uh, the Olympic Stadium in Helsinki was opened for cross-country skiing, so it seems to be very uh, popular. So the role of the state and our ministry in Finland is mainly to uh, create possibilities uh, for sport organization and sport clubs. In concrete terms, uh, this means funding for the basic uh, work sport clubs do every day. But we have also tried to create some new forms uh, of special assistance uh, to support new activities. Um, first, when the pandemic started in spring 2020, uh, sport premises were closed by the government's decision for a few months. And then uh, we also opened the first ex extra call for support for sport clubs. In this phase, I believe we were all quite optimistic about the, how long the pandemic will last. And also the first call uh, was only to cover two months' uh, salaries and rental costs uh, for sport clubs to get over the first shock. Uh, but of course, uh, it wasn't enough. And when the pandemic continued in second phase in autumn 2020, we uh, directed support to sport federations in order to cover COVID-19 related costs, but also to create uh, new innovations and new ways to do sports in sport clubs. Um, the grant amount was approximately 3 million euros. And this amount allowed, for example, creating uh, training modules uh, for trainers and staff to enhance new skills and competencies, as well as uh, creating new digital tools for sports. And um, as we ne well know, COVID-19 has hit not only uh, grassroots level activities, but also professional sports and uh, some leagues have been interrupted or even closed uh, during pandemia. And also they have suffered from lack of audience uh, due to restrictions. And in Finland, our ministry has therefore also directed extra funding uh, for sport clubs attending professional leagues in 2020 and 2021, approximately 1.4 million per year to cover most urgent costs. 
And uh, last year in 2021, we also boosted direct grants uh, for sport clubs to help them to keep going and providing their services all the way from the bottom level to the top level athletes. Uh, we do support sport clubs in normal circumstances as well, but now these grants have been increased temporarily. So all in all, the government has supported sport with extra 36 million euros uh, during the pandemic, in addition to annual budget of approximately 150 million euros. This doesn't cover amounts directed uh, for sport by cities and municipalities that are also important, and also we have extra uh, funding for uh, private sport clubs and um, training studios and gyms, for example, so they are not covered by these. I know my answer is a bit boring, uh, since uh, governance motivation is very finance-oriented, but uh, we consider it best that, uh, uh, that appropriate actions are created in the field by professionals, and I think this is all the same way that uh, we also work in Erasmus+. Plus. Thank you, Heidi. And uh, it's indeed, it's very important that, that funding is, is key, so I wouldn't call it necessarily boring. It's simply very important and, uh, and probably has been necessary to keep the sector uh, going in, in Finland and probably this is very similar in other, other countries. But what I also take up from your intervention is that uh, you have noted a different way of practicing sport uh, to your social media and maybe other, other evidence that, uh, that came to you. And you've tried to adapt and to also offer and support the people who are interested in these kind of forms to, um, to innovate and to change and to also widen the spectrum of uh, possibilities to practice sport. And I hope this is also an inspiration for the listeners uh, that this could be something uh, uh, to think about when you're submitting your uh, Erasmus Plus project. Thank you. So now I turn to Jean, please. And um, I already mentioned you were in charge of uh, the organization of a European uh, Athletics Championship in 2020, uh, which was, of course, at the time of the pandemic, where maybe things were even more difficult than they are today not because uh, of the restrictions, but also of the great uncertainty. We didn't know where this, this was going, and there was a lot more fear and uncertainty uh, to see what to cope, and we didn't have the experience that we have now. So perhaps you could share with us how, as an organization, you, uh, you are coping with the difficulties and trying to keep uh, the Federation and its activity going, even in spite of those very difficult two years that we just uh, passed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flor. Uh, in fact, it has been a, a very, a very difficult uh, situation. Um, we, j just as a, a feedback, okay, uh, these championships that we were supposed to organize in 2020, uh, France was uh, waiting since uh, 82 years to receive this competition. So we were really uh, thinking that uh, uh, this was very important for us, for the, for the French uh, people, but also for the European ones. Um, so this event was supposed to be organized in August 2020 by the European Athletics and by the French Athletic Federation. And it was also supposed to, supposed to launch the 33rd Olympiad uh, uh, towards Paris 2024. Um, so this should have been really a, a, a major sport, uh, sporting event and popular event as well uh, for thousands of athletes, for thousands of spectators, viewers, and also of journalists and uh, volunteers. Uh, we were, at that time, uh, we started already the organization of the championships in 2017, and uh, we were 70 people working full time for this event. And at that time, we already had sold 60% of our ticket sales. So it was really, really prom promising. Uh, and when the COVID came, we, we started first, you know, to uh, uh, let's, let's try to, to continue to do it. And we, we tried and we worked very hardly with the uh, uh, medical department and with the French authorities to see how, which measures we will be able to put in place to still continue to organize because it was so important for the athletes to be, to be there. And uh, we worked many weeks uh, to find solutions by implementing special activities towards the COVID, by 
even modifying the events because uh, we were f at the beginning supposed to organize the charity stadium, but also inside the city of Paris and the Trocadero. And uh, so we downsized the event to, to put it much more secure uh, and to be uh, uh, agreed. And at the end, we, we did not find the proper solution. And then we said, okay, let's try now to postpone the event like many other organizations have done. And uh, the uncertainties that you, you mentioned because it was the beginning of the COVID and we didn't know in 2020 what will happen in 2021 and afterwards. And we know where we are now. So, <laughs> and uh, at that time we said, okay, and economically it was totally impossible to, 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 to do it. So we decided to cancel the event on the 23rd of April, 2020. This date will be in my memory forever. Uh, wh what I should mention that uh, uh, for this event, we, we were also uh, um, part of an Erasmus project, which was uh, funded by the European Commission, and uh, it was a non-for-profit event called uh, European Volunteer and Active Citizen. And then we, after that cancellation, we spoke with uh, uh, Luciano and with, uh, with Yves to see, okay, uh, the event is, is dead, but the 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 uh, way the reason why we were doing this uh, project uh, was not dead so we still worked and we we redesigned the project on a different way and we managed to 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 do it through uh, for sure through uh, uh, e, 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 uh, for teleconferences and things like that but still we were we had a chance because in october 2020 we still had the, the pandemic was down and we we did the uh, uh, a physical gathering of uh, 250 people who came from the volunteers and we had 300 uh, attending by teleconference and it was really, really a good success and I want to take this opportunity to thank European Commission for, for having trust uh, on us and it was a good project. Taking the lessons of all that, European Athletics, you know, has suffered a lot because all events in 2020 were, were cancelled, all, not a single one has, has stayed. Um, so still, uh, the president of European Analytics and, and the council uh, decided that we absolutely need to uh, maintain the events in 2021. And we were supposed to organize 13 events in 2021, and in reality, we organized 11, which is the biggest part. And uh, I should say that we have been very proud of doing that because, uh, you know, the first event was the European Indoor Championships in Torun in, uh, in March 2021. And when you, you saw the athletes, they are so happy to really start again, to meet uh, and to compete uh, against the others, and it was fantastic, you know? And we, we had very workly with the, for sure, the, 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 the different uh, uh, organizations, national governments, uh, uh, to put the safety measures in place. It costs some money, I should say, but uh, we, we, we succeed on that, and we are very proud to say that we, we put in place really strong protocols that we can still maintain the competition, having a special bubble for the athletes, another one for the journalists, another one for the uh, other officials, and we succeed and we, we really organize quite all events in 2021. So now we are ready, we, we know how to do, and, uh, but we still hope that this pandemic will be finished and that we will go back to the normal life. Thank you. Thank you, John. And what, what I recall most from you is to say that all, despite all these difficulties and these dates, which were so hard and you had to kind of, you will always remember this date when things were canceled, that, that it makes up when you see the happy faces of athletes that are so pleased that you have organized all this. And I think this deserves really deep respect from your federation and probably many other federations who have done behind the scenes so much work to be able to keep us. And this goes for the athletes. It also goes for the spectators because in some of the toughest moments that was sport to watch on TV and, and matches to follow, I think have brought a lot of console of normality and continuity and joy in, uh, in the lives of uh, many Europeans. So thank you. And I will now turn to, to Gloria, where we're changing the subject a little bit. And of course, COVID has been really a reset where everything we planned had to, uh, to be done differently. But it also has been a moment, I think, where we appreciated uh, the importance of our health, of our well-being. Uh, 
for us in society is very, very important and deserves our, our attention. And here, this is something you have been a strong advocate for um, uh, supporting uh, the rights of athletes, notably for children, also the preservation of dignity, the fight against abuse, and you've done a lot of Erasmus projects in this field. And also, of course, this project had to continue because it's not that it's covered that you can cancel this important work. So how have you lived this, uh, this period and how have you coped uh, to get by? Thank you so much. I am uh, very, very honored to be here today on this side of the table. I have been on the other side several times. So this is, uh, this is a great honor for me to be here today. I have participated in several um, life-changing uh, Erasmus Plus projects with direct positive impact on people on the ground. Um, I first came in contact with the program in 2015 when I was invited to participate in the final conference of a project called uh, sport respect your rights. This was the first time that I spoke about my own experience of abuse in sport and um, in an international setting and uh, it literally changed my life. It was in that context of that year, uh, Erasmus Plus project that I stopped being a victim and I became a survivor. And I decided that being a survivor of sexual abuse in sport was really my superpower. And I could use this superpower to help organizations uh, provide safe and, pr and protective and supportive environments for children to play sport. Um, it, you know, it's um, the sport, after the Sport Respects Your Rights project, I, um, I was part of a steering committee of a project called Voices for Truth and Dignity, um, where we, uh, a qualitative study was conducted on the life experiences of 72 European former athletes with lived experiences of sexual abuse in sport. Uh, and this project saved, I mean, uh, changed the lives of many of those survivors who were, for the first time, speaking up and disclosing about their experiences of abuse in sport. After the project, uh, we formed a very strong community of survivors in Europe with very, very strong bonds. Um, several survivors' organizations were formed in different countries in Europe. And to this day, we, we still collaborate with each other, um, you know, um, uh, imp implementing safeguarding, um, raising awareness and helping sport organizations, institutions and governments um, to uh, implement safeguards and keep children and adults at, at risk safe in sport. The last uh, Erasmus Plus project that I participated in was a, uh, as a project coordinator and it was a project called the I Protect project. This project, um, with a very high-level uh, team of experts in Europe, we developed educational materials, we developed a platform in, in, in different languages to provide education um, for grassroots organizations. We developed courses on, um, for coaches, for parents, for the adult, for the children themselves participating, and for sports management in different, um, in different languages. And, um, this is fantastic and is still making a difference. It's still providing free education for people on the ground. So this was also a very important project. So yes, I am a big fan of the Erasmus Plus program. Um, it is perfect to make a positive impact on people on the ground. We all know how difficult it is to get finances and uh, financing for projects like this uh, with difficult topics, with topics that have been taboo in the past. Uh, but guys, it is like Christmas. I mean, 72, 70 million euros at your disposal to fight against violence, against discrimination and intolerance in sport, to fight for integrity, for inclusion, reconciliation, and to promote the common values of, of, of sport. This is uh, amazing. And you now have the opportunity to also submit proposals for capacity building uh, and education programs and projects. This is, this is fantastic. So get to work, uh, submit your proposals, and make a difference. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story, uh, Gloria. That's uh, very impressive, and it's, uh, 
It's very uh, impressive to see, and uh, we all uh, owe you respect for bringing your sport values of trying to achieve, to perform, uh, resilience and, and continue even in spite of the hardest difficulties is something that is very inspiring. And indeed, this, this could inspire hopefully many other Erasmus projects. Also in this period where we have all fell down at times to see this is a story of keep going and, and I'm sure, I hope your story can inspire some of the others to come with, uh, with similar projects where uh, we keep going, we carry each other and we look for a future without discrimination and intolerance and, and abuse. Thank you. And we have Eva, who I don't see in the room. I hope she's here somewhere um, on screen soon for me. Um, because I would like to ask her a question as well. Uh, I'm here, Floor. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So you're, you're on the back, so I can't see. Yeah, yeah, there you are. Well, welcome to our community. And uh, yes, uh, thanks for being here um, with us um, to this morning. And talking about the subject of um, health and well-being, which is so important, uh, you represent ENGSO Youth, who have actually come with a pledge, and everybody knows what is a pledge after Stefano has explained it, but ENGSO Youth Pledge was focusing on mental and um, physical health enhancing sport for young people, and we know that especially young people have been really suffering in, the, in this crisis because everything they need was taken away from them. And perhaps you can tell a little bit what you do and what your pledge is about uh, to give support and to allow people to overcome these difficulties. The floor, so giving us space to explain what we're doing, especially uh, when we know that youth is one of the main stakeholders in the sport movement, and quite often it is a case that we don't get, this, uh, get, uh, get to give our say. So uh, kudos to European Commission, thank you for having us here. Um, so in terms of what we're doing uh, in ENGZO Youth, we are uh, already committed to healthy lifestyles through our work. So one of the main topics that we are uh, tackling uh, is health. And this uh, really pledge came as a really a silver bullet for us and we, we, uh, we were glad that it came up and we were basically on board from the first time we heard about it. So uh, what we did, we analyzed the pillars that were offered, which Stefano uh, kindly presented, and we, uh, we agreed that the most convenient one for the organization and for our mission was uh, to give more awareness for healthy lifestyles across all generations. Of course, um, for us, it is important to emphasize youth and also to give youth voices. So our pledge is titled From Youth to Youth where we also include our Young Delegates, which is a program that we lead uh, within ENGZO Youth, where we want to give them also a voice on how to make this uh, campaign happen. So basically, in very practical terms, it is um, we will be creating and leading an online campaign uh, for people under age of 35, also created by young people under age of 35, uh, not only providing the information uh, on, on healthy lifestyles, but also engaging them in, in challenges and really actively uh, searching for opportunities to, to get to know uh, the value of healthy lifestyles, but also to experience uh, it firsthand. Um, so, as said, uh, just one example to give you, we recently started uh, to, to, to put uh, into action our pledge uh, where we had uh, Tabea Werner, for example, our German representative is one of our young delegates. She uh, came up with a mindfulness challenge uh, that was shared on our social media and is still uh, ongoing. Of course, Floor, as you said, it is very uh, relevant nowadays, the topic of mental health. So we thought, well, it, we, we want to give some mindfulness um, exercises and, and insights in how to really um, yeah, keep your mental state uh, stable and, and healthy. Um, so for us, in the next two years, this will include uh, regular social media posts because we have 
quite a, a large social media uh, followings. It will um, also include our uh, promotion of our policy papers, uh, which one of the recent one was de dedicated to the mental health specifically in, but also through sports. And um, also, uh, coincidentally, before, uh, you know, this healthy lifestyle for all was, was uh, that we heard about it, we also applied for a project, for Erasmus project, that uh, had uh, in focus youth mental health. So um, we also hope for positive out outcomes uh, in the next days. But um, yes, this will also contain a campaign um, uh, to support this goal. So yeah, we have a big plans in Anxo Youth uh, and we are uh, happy to also not only to pledge, but also to deliver them. Thank you, thank you. And this is very important and relevant work and right what, uh, what many young people will, uh, will need. And I hope that your campaign can really reach out far and wide and, uh, and make a difference in this, uh, this way. So we have um, uh, still time for a second round of questions, a bit shorter this time. So at the end, hopefully, we, uh, we manage also to take some questions from, uh, from the audience. And I, I actually, my first question is, is um, uh, for, for Eva first, um, and I will also ask, ask Gloria so you can think of the answer the same question. Um, how, how can you motivate uh, either uh, an organization or the partners in an Erasmus project to, um, to come together and to, uh, to work on a, on a pledge? Um, so Eva and, and Gloria, maybe you can give us an insight. How do you bring these partnerships together and how can you motivate them around a common issue such as healthy lifestyle. Eva, can you go first, please? Uh, yes. So, I mean, uh, I think it's important to emphasize what is it in, in it for them. So, um, I think uh, th there's a lot of lots of benefits, but just taken uh, from a very stakeholder perspective, I think it's a, a very good venue to demonstrate to their stakeholders that they care. So they care about this very, uh, you know, uh, the most, you know, the biggest value that we have, and that is health. So uh, preserving health, and if something bad happens, then really correcting it via a physical activity, because uh, physical activity can do very, very much. So it's, a, I would say, a formalization of the commitment um, of sport that sport had already in the past. You know, sport is tightly linked to health. Uh, sometimes it is quite unfortunately forgotten, as we see in Gloria's case. Um, but uh, I think this also pledge uh, serves that purpose to really remind us all that sport and health go hand in hand. Uh, and also one last point very shortly, I think uh, within the you know, global discussions uh, of sustainable development, uh, et cetera, this is you know, a direct tackle of the sustainable development goal number three, where we have the, the collaborative uh, action and co-creative action um, that can hopefully lead to, to better health for all. Um, so yeah, I think uh, if you ask me on the top of my head, these would be very the biggest two reasons that I would say that uh, the stakeholders would need to get engaged. Thank you. Also, the same question for you, Gloria. Yes, uh, thank you. I, um, I keep thinking about the 90 days that, are, that we were stuck in our homes during at the beginning of the pandemic, where we couldn't even go out to buy groceries at home in, in Spain, and how difficult it was for us to move and to, to, to keep up a sane head uh, in all of this, you know, um, while, while you can't even get out of the house. So it is really important to, to make sure that, um, that sport is accessible for everybody um, at, at all levels uh, to keep um, a healthy lifestyle, to keep healthy physically and mentally. Uh, and, uh, and, and I encourage all of the sport organizations, institutions, governments to, to make this pledge and, and keep uh, people safe and, and, and healthy. It's not like uh, it's the most important thing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Jean. Um, you already mentioned, after all the work in the uh, competitions, how happy the athletes were. And we see here, we hear that especially young people have been hit hard in the pandemic. And this is also why uh, this year is the European Year of Youth. And what specifically for young people do you do to keep them motivated to practice sport, to, to get engaged, not to let themselves down, but to get out and be healthy and, and enjoy the kind of uh, sport activities that you and other federations are offering them? Thank you, uh, uh, Fleur. Uh, I, I will complement what Gloria just said. And uh, uh, we, we have the situation of this pandemic, which is something which happened only Two, two years ago, uh, which, uh, uh, in fact, w we see much more things and uh, we realize much, uh, how much important is uh, the health and the, menten, uh, the, the, the mental of the people and that um, uh, the sport has to work on that issue. Um, athletics uh, has always been seen as a competition and you said it in your introduction earlier that uh, uh, European Athletics is a, a, a competition organization. But uh, uh, this is that what everybody understands. Uh, uh, but in reality, since about two, 10 years now, European Athletics has, has, has went through a, a second pillar. The pillar, our heart is the competition, but still we have a second pillar, which is uh, health and well-being. Um, for not only the youth, because uh, everybody mentioned the youth, but uh, the situation of the people, the old people, but also the, I would say, old people uh, on the current uh, uh, social uh, environment is very important. And today the sport is a really strong medication. It's uh, the better medication, costs much, much, much less than the medication, and uh, you can avoid a, a lot, a lot of diseases, about, about a lot of uh, illnesses and, and, and things like that. So we, we realize that. But between realizing that at uh, European Athletics headquarters in, in Lausanne and then being able to expand that to the 51 member federations, it's another, another topic. So um, on some Western countries, they realize that as well. My own federation, French Athletic Federation, is doing that since more than 15 years now, but it was not uh, easy. So we, we decided to really awareness, uh, and this is one of the important things that you put onto the pledge, to, to explain how important it is in our federations, not only to do competition, but also to uh, go on this uh, second pillar. So uh, we worked very hardly. We are still in the middle. Uh, we have a lot of work to continue to do and especially on some uh, Eastern countries, which is uh, where the situation is much more complicated. Uh, and, but we are totally convinced that this is a, a necessary, and the pandemic has shown us how important and how urgent it is to do the job. Thank you. And, and what you're saying is that, that it's one thing to, um, to have the idea and then another to implement it, especially in all the diversity. But this is the nice thing about Europe. We all do different things and we can learn um, from the diverse approaches and uh, everybody can have experiences that are worth sharing. So Heidi, uh, coming from one of the member states, um, Perhaps you can give us a good practice or something that, that you have learned in Finland uh, on how to promote health and sport that is worth sharing uh, wider. Thank you. Um, yes, like I mentioned before, uh, the pandemic hasn't been all darkness. Uh, at least in Finland, we have uh, received new um, participants, especially in outdoor sports. But my example comes from uh, youth uh, or young people's point of view as well, since we are having this Euro European Year of Youth at the moment, and Erasmus is also a joint program for education, youth and sport. So I would like to highlight the joint initiative, a national initiative in Finland, uh, including both uh, sport and youth sectors, and it was for summer 2021. The idea was to provide uh, opportunity for sport clubs to hire young persons 16 years old and older to work for them uh, for two weeks during the summertime and cover costs uh, with a special grant. 
and this uh, project enabled uh, sport clubs to open more activities during the summertime, which was especially important after restrictions during the winter and, and uh, spring time. And we had uh, really good uh, results. Uh, the sports club uh, could open more and uh, smaller training groups um, for children, which was uh, really needed. Uh, summertime day sport camps are very popular in Finland, but last summer there was a risk uh, that some would uh, some children would be left out because uh, the COVID-19 safety rules and restrictions and uh, therefore it was very good to have new uh, participants uh, for sports clubs to, to run these uh, uh, groups. And it was also possible to create new uh, groups, especially for returners. Uh, during winter, a number of children dropped out uh, from their sport hobbies uh, due to restrictions, but were still interested to continue when it was safe and possible. Uh, so also in this regard, it was a good experiment to uh, allow new possibilities. And thirdly, uh, also, it was good for uh, returners who were 16 or older, uh, they or even active members in sport clubs, uh, they were also offered a new perspective uh, to work in their sport clubs. Uh, most of them worked as uh, instructors, but also uh, other tasks were possible. We all know, for example, that uh, young people have skills and competencies the older ones uh, might not might lack, especially when it comes to social media, marketing, etc. So also in this regard, it was a successful experiment. We hope that it will continue next summer, but no decisions are done yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that and also putting these links between uh, youth and, and sport, uh, which could hopefully also be, again, an inspiration for everyone who is listening. Uh, we have a little bit of time left for questions from the audience, if we can um, get some up. Uh, yes. Um, so I'd, I'd like to ask the colleagues in the backstage, I believe we had a, a question. Uh, otherwise, I can read it out loud. Yeah, there it is. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Um, can be achieved. So, um, maybe Flor, I can take this uh, this question. Um, um, f thank you for it, first of all, and uh, uh, that that's actually a good chance to clarify. Uh, how it works. So mm, they have very similar names. So the priority uh, promotion of healthy lifestyles and the healthy lifestyle for all, they have similar, similar names, but um, they are separated. So there are two different uh, things. Um, you can be part of the healthy lifestyle for all anytime you want. Uh, whenever you have uh, a good idea, it has no connection uh, with Erasmus. Uh, this is an an initiative without a budget, and basically the more uh, pledges we have, uh, it means that the more communities are engaged, uh, especially the small ones, they are very important, but if you are an organization or a federation that has a national or a European uh, level, that would, be, uh, that would be very interesting, it would be uh, delighted to have uh, pledges. So you can do it at uh, any time. If your interest is uh, in Erasmus+, uh, the idea was to implement the healthy lifestyle for all, and, uh, to res and, and to allow you to develop maybe a bigger idea uh, with, uh, with, uh, with funding. So that will come basically in uh, one year uh, from now. And uh, because, as I said, the healthy lifestyle for all initiative doesn't have funding. And you can do it two ways. You can send it immediately, and uh, you already, maybe you're already starting to work on it. And then with Erasmus+, Plus, uh, you can get it uh, a step farther or send a new pledge. Maybe you are an Erasmus+, Plus project, and you're already doing a lot of good, and you want to uh, give it more visibility, you can do it as well. Uh, what has to be um, uh, clear, I believe, after this, uh, this session, is that you don't uh, need to send a pledge or send a pledge afterwards to be part of Erasmus Plus, or if you are part of Erasmus Plus. So you can implement a project in um, a teaming for a holistic approach, for instance, the, first, the third pillar, 
which would be very important in Erasmus+, Plus, be awarded a project and not be part of the Healthy Lifestyle for All initiative if you don't wish so. Um, so I, I hope uh, that this, uh, um, these few minutes uh, clarify it. Uh, if not, um, I'm on Connex Me, so you can uh, send me questions and I will try to uh, reply to all of you. Thank you. I think we can take another question. No? I'm seeing technicians say no, no questions. Well, if there are no other questions, it means you have all been super clear. <laughs> At least when I can say personally, you've all been very inspiring and uplifting and being all four of you showing that even in hardship and against challenges, you can go forward and uh, come with positive stories and uh, make Europe and make sport a better place, for which I would like to really warmly thank you all. And with that, thank you. Also, thank you for listening to our panel debate. I hope it was inspiring for you as well. And for now, I wish you a good lunch and a good rest of uh, the info day that will continue tomorrow.